Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll get into our in introductions in just a moment, but actually I thought it would be great um, to start. I'd love to hear from some of you um, with, with just a, a sense of, of who you are, maybe, maybe where you are in the world or whatever you feel comfortable sharing, something you're working on. Um, and also we're, we're thinking a lot about this question of how would you ideally like people to experience your work? Um, what sort of context does it live in? Is it an installation? Is it in the gallery? Is it in the metaverse? If it's in the metaverse, like what type of experience are you building around your work? Um, I think so much of the conversation in the um, NFT space is there's a lot of conversation around the work that's happening. There's maybe a little bit less conversation around how we're presenting our work and how we're experiencing our work. So I'd love to just start off, get a sense of um, what you all are thinking in, in that respect. Does so anyone feel like um, sharing anything? Is it too early? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Aidan. Uh, I'm Pierre. I'm, I'm based in, uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm a crypto artist and uh, I, I think it's very, very important for, uh, for every crypto artist uh, to have a, a space to be able to, to display and show our art in the way we intend it to be displayed. And in my case, I have been thinking, I have in my mind some particular spaces where I would We like... have a very talkative... Uh, um, uh, Miko, you're, I think you're still, um, you're not muted. Just, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I said Pierre has uh, unmuted his microphone, but I don't know if he wanted to speak or not. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm asking people to, um, to share some of what they're working on and, um, awesome. and what they're excited about in terms of how you want people to experience your work. Um, so, so thank you, Pierre, for, for joining. Okay. So shall I continue or? Yes, please, please do. Yes. So I, I was saying that uh, it, it's super important. Uh, uh, to be able to build spaces to show our work in the way we intend to show it. And in my case, Hi. I had in mind some... Uh, uh, we didn't understand the, the question. Uh, like, um, sure, uh, we so work with AI and our work is uh, shown on screens. Like, <laughs> beyond screens, uh, we couldn't answer anything. <laughs> Sure. So I'll just uh, hear the rest of what uh, Pierre was going to say, and then I'll, I'll explain the question again, because it's definitely important that we be um, that we sort of understand this question as we move forward and thinking about the metaverse and thinking about art experiences and social art experiences in the metaverse. Um, but P Pierre, were you done or did you have another thought? No, just to finish my sentence. <laughs> Yes, that uh, I, I have in mind idea of architectural structures in which I would love to show my art. I'm working in series and sometimes I like, oh, for this particular series of six or ten pieces, I would imagine a particular space with some architectural features and I just have no idea how to build it, no idea how to do it. So I'm super interested to learn how we can build these uh, spaces in the metaverse to show our work in the way we intend to show it. So thank you. And I will uh, definitely be super interested to, to learn about Arium. Sure. So thank you for sharing. Um, there's this idea of, of if you're building work in series of how to present work as a series. So that's one idea. And that's a really sort of um, strong thought, especially when we're presenting our work digitally. Um, and just to to kind of to return to this question, I think when when I'm asking the question, how would you like people to experience your work? I'm I'm wondering about the entire context of 
who who are you specifically um, inviting to see your work? Um, are they experiencing it screen based? Is it happening in the physical world in some sort of installation? Um, if your work is natively digital, as I suspect many of, of your work is, um, do you do you show that in a gallery environment in the physical world, but on a screen? Do you show it in a metaverse environment? Do you show it um, on a custom portfolio website or something like that? Really, what is the environment around your work? And how do you build story and context into your work? Um, so that, that's my question uh, for you all to, not necessarily to answer right away, but to bring into this next hour as we think about um, what possibilities are being presented to us in the metaverse. Um, before we move on, any other any other thoughts on these on these topics or questions on this topic? Yeah, like I, I would you like to present myself a little bit. Like I'm a I'm a digital artist from Brazil, and I've been working with 3D since the final of 2019, and I'm. I, when I started doing 3D, I was really thinking about the creation of an environment that people can enter in. And I was not really familiar with AR in that time. And I got in, really into 3D. So like my, my work right now is basically environments that I create, but people, it, it, it's not really interactive, you know, and... Now I'm trying to think how I can expand this idea and how I can like build like like I don't know the, the name like the guy said Pierre Pierre said uh a way a way to, to make a as a bitch design to present a series a specific series that people can interact with this the pieces and make things with the pieces. And yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with with Arium. I, I think you guys are doing an amazing job, and I've been on some some exhibitions in in Arium space. And yeah, like thank you, thank you for having for for having us, and thank you, thank you for being here. That that's awesome to to know more about about the project and the ideas behind this behind this. Yeah, thank that, thanks, thanks for sharing. Um... So I just just to echo some of what I heard from you is there's this idea of building the environment um, around the work or maybe the environment even is the work or is part of the work. Um, and then there's this second idea, which is equally important of interactivity um, and interactivity can be understood in a lot of ways. Of course, um, there's yeah. interactivity between the individual and the work between the individual and other individuals experiencing the work. Um, maybe there's, you could even think of interactivity as being a conversation that happens between your work and another artist's work and the whole context, socially, geographically, politically, that you're building work in, within. Um, so I think understanding how we can represent these ideas and these levels of interactivity um, in, in the way that we present our work is, is super core to what um, Dan and I are, are building in Arium. So just for the sake of time that we could talk for an hour about this um, topic, but I want to move on uh, just for the sake of time um, and start to present a little bit about Arium and about Dan and my background. And then at the end of this um, short presentation, hopefully short, um, we will get into um, we'll get into um, actually showing some of the editor as it is today. Um, so Arium, we are presenting immersive social metaverse experiences for creative communities. I think some of you have seen uh, the platform. Um, if, you, if you haven't, we'll, we'll show some uh, shortly. Um, before we get too much into the, into the platform, into the metaverse, um, I just want to share a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, my background is mostly in live theater and interactive installations. So um, this, this photo is from a, from a piece I did a few years ago. And the main thing I want you to notice in this photo is not the, the piece, which was some sort of um, music 
through map making piece, um, the main the main thing I want you to notice is the fact that there are all of these people here. Um, and I think a lot of my experience with with art and with uh, performing arts has been full of people. Um, so this is a, a project I worked on that was a piece by Ai Weiwei in collaboration with with um, Herzog and Dumeron, a Swiss architecture firm. That was all about surveillance, surveillance in terms of surveillance capitalism, in terms of surveillance um, from state surveillance, state actors, in terms of the technology around surveillance. And to, to build this piece, what, what we actually did was basically create um, a surveillance mechanism in this incredibly large open space. This is actually the largest space in New York City without columns, um, the largest open space in Manhattan. Um, and so every day you'd have these people entering this space where the, the, the environment is part and parcel to the message that's being shown. So it's not a white box gallery environment. It's a gallery um, in which your interaction with the technology that's, um, that's all around you, in, in this case, it was surveillance technology, your interaction with the people that are around you um, really determines the experience that you're having. And another piece I'll show quickly from there is this piece I, I was uh, very pleased to work on by Hito Sterl. Um, the piece on the left is called, it, it's actually my favorite name for a video piece ever. It's called Hell Yeah, We Fuck Die. Um, but the, the thing that I found most inspiring about Hito Sterl's work is the fact that every aspect of the um of the environment around the piece again and i'm going to kind of bang this drum all day every aspect of the environment around the piece determined your experience going into it and so it's these are ostensibly video pieces um but they're video pieces that were built in a in an environment in a set essentially um where on the left there's this very industrial metallic structure built around it and these light boxes and on the right there are these very custom uh, glass pieces that that distorted the video in a number of interesting ways and um, the video work was presented in this environment and this environment enhanced that work through um, pulling in alternative context uh, and next dan is going to say a little bit about his background yeah, I'll just share. Hold on, I'll I'll uh, share my screen so that I can. Um, sure. Do you want me I got to? The, I got no. I got I got it working. Okay. I think. Am I sharing now? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. Aiden. Maybe you stop sharing. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Cool. So my background for a while as a programmer, um, doing building real time applications. Uh, on the left. Uh, I built a multiplayer real-time gamified cycling class um, that connected to bike data and aggregated into visualizations that would make people <laughs> try to bike harder. And on the right, um, I worked with uh, researchers at, the Google, at Google and the Google Creative Lab to open source a machine learning library called PoseNet, which allowed creatives to easily access a pose estimation algorithm right from the browser uh, with a few lines of code. Um, and then I went to a graduate school uh, called ITP with Aiden in, at NYU. It's an interactive, it's a school that's basically at the interact uh, section of art and technology. Um, a big part of the student experience was the end of the year student showcase, which is a highly social experience where the experience of both showing the work was just as important as being in the room with everyone and, and talking to everyone about it. Um, and then the pandemic happened, and um, that show couldn't couldn't happen. Uh, this is in 2021, 2020. And then, um, Aiden, you can talk about uh, what you built to solve sure. it. So um, what we started with was a browser-based uh, events platform with uh, real-time webcam, audio, and video in a rendered 3D environment. Um, something that has become a familiar interface, but in, in 2020 was, was less common and less familiar as an interface. And so the, the, the guests, which are alumni of the program and people from New York's media art scene, um, 
would enter and navigate this environment using WASD gaming controls and communicate with one another directly using spatial audio and video. And the hosts, which were my, myself and the artists as part of this graduate program, were able to put their work on the wall and, um, and share different information about their work in this environment. And we first opened this prototype in, um, in May. And what was most exciting was not the initial, um, the initial showcase, which, which ended up getting you know, several hundred people from around the world who had, who had not been able to travel to New York um, for the actual show, but were able to connect to it. So that was exciting. But what was most exciting for me was the fact that there were all these unintended use cases. So over the course of the next days and weeks, um, the show sort of made, made the rounds on Twitter, and we ended up finding every day you'd go there, you'd run into someone from a different part of the world. Um, at one point, there were a group of Brazilian um, creative technologists and media artists, professors. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I remember the exact name of the, the program, um, but they were using the space as, uh, as a place to hold concerts and DJ sets. Um, so there are all these unintended use cases that really brought the space to life and made it move from a space that is very much um, dead and static to a space that's vibrant and exciting. And Dan, if you move to the next slide. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm just going to tell about quickly how I got into this project. So in graduate school, I was really into like the inner basically exploring how you could turn uh, analog sources into sounds and connect different kinds of sensors. So I did a lot of experimentation with um, uh, pointing cameras at liquids and turning and grabbing and measuring liquids and connecting them into sound modulation values. Um, so here's like a liquid timer. I don't know, can you guys hear sounds from this? The sound plan? Uh, no, we're not hearing your... Okay, let me stop sharing. I wonder if I can actually do that one second. Hold on. Uh, can I do sounds? Uh, I guess not. Um, we can share some of the links. Uh, afterwards, maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll just do my presentation without sound. It's fine. Um, and then I basically got really into turning kind of this thing into performance, this kind of experimentation. And uh, I um, performed this at a venue as part of like our graduate school program, where I would. Uh, I wish the sound was working, but basically. We're, uh, we're hearing the sound now. Okay. We have a lot to go through, so I won't go through everything. But um, I started very much experimenting with like taking liquids and analog sensors and connecting them to sound, so you could have like a really like exploring ways that that could be um, done. And uh, and then uh, wait, I'm missing some a slide here. Then I went to um, the Amsterdam dance event in in Amsterdam in 2019, and. Uh, I, of course, I went to like a lot of dance dance venues, but then I went to this one thing uh, by Forty Sound, which is a a spatial sound produce production company based out of um, uh, Budapest, and they produce this event in this church with uh, sixty speakers connected to am ambulant modular synthesizers, where they would move the sound a bunch of different sounds around the room and connect it to lights, and it was like such an amazing experience, not just to witness this, but also to experience this with a room full of people, and it was like. I was so, so touched and like, I really want, uh, I really was really intrigued by this kind of um, experience. And then the pandemic hit and that couldn't happen anymore. And um, I kind of wanted to figure out how that could be recreated in a virtual environment. So I built basically a version of a live stream performance where 
you could stream um, a live set into a 3D space and attach uh, sound to these balls of lights that would move around the room. And um, the lights would be modulated by the sounds. And, um, and if you're wearing headphones, you would actually hear the spatial audio around you. And this is basically my first uh, foray into this Arium kind of experience. So this is basically being live streamed into the space. Um, this is kind of like the video that's being live streamed that convert MIDI values um, into the position of where these sounds are. And this is it being experienced by a bunch of people in a room. So wherever you are in the room, basically, you would hear kind of something different because the sound would get closer and louder to you. Um, so anyways, also, so I worked on this and I was really like excited about the what this would could kind of bring. And we also modified it so that other people could collaboratively put their work into the space. And this is kind of the event that ended up happening. No, this is basically like a space that was collaboratively built with work showed everywhere. Noah, how are you doing? Um, we could do like this person did a live stream thing, uh, live stream like ultra wide video. Um, and then someone did a DJ set at the end, and we all hung out there for hours. Anyways, um, this is amazing. Uh, I could send links to this later. I guess other examples, yeah. So this is basically like everyone, this is cool because this is actually a single live stream broken into three different uh, screens. Um, yeah, so Dan, I'll just mention a couple things um, yeah. about why why this event was, was and is important to us. I think the first is that we've really from the start been focused on live and having live experiences that uh, can have these different levels of interactivity between the, the audience and the content you can have live content you can have um, static content of course but you can also bring in um, and, and manipulate content in real time the second is that this is uh, the the toolkit that we're building now this arium toolkit is um is natively a collaborative toolkit it's meant to be used with multiple people and we know that art doesn't exist in a um I mean, there is there are solo artists for sure, but um, a lot of times we have artists working together to build spaces collaboratively um, or creative communities building spaces to, for a showcase, as the case was um, just a, a month or so ago with um, the last um, vertical crypto art residency. Um, uh, yeah, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, so take a while fast forward we didn't know anything about nfts at all <laughs> and then we were making a bunch of events for a bunch of different kinds of people um and then we got introduced to uh eleanor breezy um who was a curator for hackatow who's uh, one of the top crypto artists um we produced the first event for them it was really successful the art ended up selling a lot and then um the world we're kind of spread in the community and we've just been kind of like focusing on crypto artists and uh, crypto communities to um, create events for them because it really actually kind of makes sense as a globally connected experience. And here's a, here are some clips from some events we've hosted. Uh, this one was a uh, put on by the Museum of Contemporary Digital Art uh, and can be auction house featuring 18 emerging Italian artists. And this is a curatorial tour of these artists whose art was exhibited on, on Super Rare. Next to this work, we found it, uh, you know, sort of like organic, progressing with Mattia Cucini's work, which I have to say I can connect on a very personal level because everything you're doing... And what was really cool about this is all these people were in lockdown at the time and we could all be together in the space uh, with both the curator and the artist talking about their work. And it kind of like everyone was able to learn about the work in a new way and connect with each other. I don't want to show this next video. And this is, of course, uh, the Vertical Crypto Art Residency um, auction, where we had a live DJ set uh, 
um, this is what the this is the vertical crypto art fundraiser auction, where there was a live VJ set by Electric Method, and Nicole was doing a live auction. In case you didn't see this, this is a, a quick playback of that event. Actually, this is the longer video. This shows kind of the live speaking capability where we have broadcasting. Um, and Uh, this is a recent exhibition we put on for the whale community, um, where we're, we're going to, we just agreed to basically have a monthly, uh, recurring event for whale shark, where we're going to show a different, um, curated collection curated by Eleanor Breezy. Uh, this is, uh, whale community, whale sharks, 24 original X copies from a couple years ago. And, um, one of the cool things we did here was, uh, which I'll show you actually later, for each piece, we made it so you could just put in a token ID and it loads the entire artwork, the history, uh, how, when it was bought, who bid on it, um, and an, a link to the marketplace. And we're, we're, I'm, showing, I'm gonna show you later how we kind of, kind of are making that tool available to people also for anything listed on OpenSea, and eventually, I mean, what was formerly Hickenunk, anything on Tezos. Um, uh, okay. This is a uh, Pupila Dilatada. This is um, five metaverse spaces created by a group of Brazilian crypto artists. In case you haven't checked out this exhibition, it is amazing. It's still up. Uh, you can walk around and just explore with a friend um, or by yourself. Um, I think I think Gabrielle Coy was in here, right? I think so. Um, and then uh, here's just like a really cool, some of the cool live capabilities where someone was VJing, silo sample, playing music live, silo samples on the eye back there, and someone else is VJing. Uh, VJ Suave. And ever this is really fun because it was a bunch of us around the world just hanging out here for hours, just enjoying this really nice music. Um, and then uh, upcoming stuff that's happening. Um, so we're going to doing a monthly exhibition of Whale Shark's collection. Uh, the next one is Giant Swan, who's who paints in VR. Amazing artist. It's at the end of the month, we'll let you know when that happens. Uh, the Mokta Foundry, they're one of the applications for the space race uh, of super rare spaces, which uh, Mikola is in with uh, Mocha. Of course, vote for them, but also vote for this one if you can, <laughs> if you have any rare tokens. Uh, um, there's a mystery artist we're not announcing yet. We're actually going to be doing a live in space minting. They've actually been, I think, I th believe they've been on the Vertical Crypto Art Show for an interview. Uh, we can't say who it is, but this is going to be amazing. And the space is going to be changing as the artworks get minted. Um, and then uh, we have a performance series with the Maxi Contemporary Museum of Art in Rome. These are just like a few things coming up, but follow us on Twitter at Arium Spaces to find out more whenever we have things co coming up. Um, so just a quick overview of what Arium offers. I know this, this has already been 30 minutes, so it's, it's a lot of presentation, I realize. Um, so everything's fully customizable, which means that every experience is unique. Uh, we don't believe that things should be really templated. We believe you should have building blocks and your, your space should be really an expression of yourself. Uh, there should be no restrictions. You shouldn't be restricted by the land around you or like the amount of land you're given in a metaverse. Like you should have complete control over your experience. Um, we, you can create live programming, live streaming broadcasting, uh, live stream 3D projection mapping, which I'm going to show you later, which is really cool for the more advanced users, which means that you have events that people stay up for hours because they're enjoying both the social aspect and the, and, and the content around it. Um, and the editor's collaborative real time that makes creating a space a shared experience. Um, where we were going, uh, I, I asked her if, not to record this, but I guess it's being recorded, but it's private. Um, the next thing I think we're working on is being able to 
purchase assets directly from within an Ethereum space. Um, other stuff we're looking at is the concept of a um, a primitive that is an exhibition, uh, like a shared shared ownership of an exhibition space, um, ticketing, and potentially metaverse installations. But you know we're 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 getting there bit by bit. Right now we just want to make everything really easy to use and get more people on it. So uh, we'd like to invite you to. I think we're getting, we're not. This is going to be less of a tutorial and more of a like just watch all the things that are possible. Because if everyone tries to follow step by step, it's going to be really slow. But I'm going to paste a link in the chat and then. Um, yeah, Dan, I'll I'll add the link. I'll I'll put the link okay. in the event text channel. Actually, um, Mikol, which which channel should I put the link in? The second residency. Uh, I just tagged you. Residency second cohort. Yes. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. So that's a link to um, to grab an invite code, and I'll just mention specifically: um, put your name down next to the invite code that you claim, um, because each one can only be claimed once. Just to make sure that you don't uh, repeat. And this invite code will allow you to, uh, you can put your name on the left. Uh, this invite code will allow you to um, create an account and create a space with Ethereum. Um, and you can get, with, your, with this invite, you should create, create three spaces with capacity of 25 each and connect them with portals. Um, we're generally, I think generally Ethereum is like free to use. Uh, um, right, yeah, so basically it's free to use and we're doing kind of more of like Web3 business models, which we're just exploring right now. Um, so anyways, uh, this time for an Arium demonstration. Um, so basically when you, uh, create a, when you get the invite link, it'll take you this thing, uh, create a space. So it'll take you to spaces new. Um, and you can either start from a template, which I think a lot of people might want to do, or an empty space. I'm just going to show from an empty space. I'm going to show you basically how uh, you can upload a 3D model and just start from scratch. So if I start with an empty space, and a lot of pe most people I think are going to want to, um, most people I believe are going to want to um, start from a template unless you're like comfortable with 3D modeling. But if I start with an empty space, I would give it a name. I'm going to call it like. Dan, test. I'm just going to qu quickly jump in here and say, um, if you have any questions throughout, um, you can feel free to ask them in the residency second cohort channel, and I'll just monitor that channel. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, Okay, so uh, so I'm gonna start this one. You give it a name. Um, you can obviously give it a password. I'm just gonna call this test for class. Um, and uh, visit this space. Okay. So this is an empty space. Now, um, Now, uh, so normally you would be able to add an image, but you need there to be a wall or a video directly in the space. So I would start here with like adding a 3D model. So basically there's two editors. There's like the basic editor and there's advanced editor. And this is where you can do the more um, uh, complex things. So you can choose like what the um, message is when people come into the space, which I'm not gonna show right now. Um, and then this is where you basically could add elements. This is a tree. So let's say I want to add a 3D model. Let's say I've created a model in Blender, and I'm not going to show you that here. We actually have a whole documentation of it. Um, let's say I've created this 3D model. I've exported it as a GLB. Right now, we ex expect, accept GLB files. Uh, so I would um, upload that model. Let me find that um, model here. So I have. Uh, a 3D model here, and I'm going to drag it into here. 
and it's just uploading it. Models, 3D models can be animated, and that's you would check this button, enable this. Um, and then you can see the model here has been uploaded. This is kind of like a warehouse style building. I go into here, and you can see I'm in the warehouse. And I can actually, if I hit T, I can take this model, I can move it around, I can um, drag it. And the cool thing is, if someone else is in the space with you, they'll see this all happening live. So everything is really dark now. So what I would do is I, would, I could turn up the environmental lighting, which is going to be an environment. I think it should be brighter. I'm not sure why it's so dark. Um, which is actually, then I would add a light here. Let's add a light. And now everything's brighter. Let me make it stronger. Um, let me make it really high. I'm not, I'm, I apologize if this is confusing. I probably should have had this set up before. Um, so I'm in this warehouse building. Uh, now let's say I want to add a piece of artwork. So I would hit T. I would add an image. I could click on the wall. And then I could just upload an image here, or I could um, drag it from here. And then let me just move it a bit away from the wall so it's not colliding it. So I have this image here on the wall. Um, and then I could also add a video by clicking here and adding a video. Let's add a video here from my thing. Move it a bit away from the wall. So one of the things we do is the video will generally play if you're close to it and um, looking at the video because we don't want a bunch of videos playing in a space because it's going to make everyone's um, computer slow. And you can actually see this in action in uh, the whale community. So actually, let me just open that another tab. So in this X copy gallery, you can see these videos are not playing unless I like am close enough and look at them. Also, the text only appears if you are close enough because we found that actually a bunch of text makes the space run really slow. And that's actually what made the last vertical crypto art residency space run slow for some people. So we now do it so that the text only renders um, if you're close. And like, so you see here that this, like the details, the history of this artwork is only rendered when you get up close to it. So yeah, all these pieces will only um, play if you, uh, I think this is downloading the video. Yeah, it's just downloading it so it's slow. Um, so that's kind of just basic kind of assets. I'm going to show you some other really cool stuff you can do. So let's say I'm outside this building um, and I am in uh, there. Let me, um, Let's say I want to, I can turn off the grid. Ideally, this is going to be like a unified interface. You don't have to go through multiple tabs. Um, but I'm going to show you now adding like water. So let's say I want to add water, which always makes everything look really nice. So I can add um, water here. And uh, you can, sorry, uh, where is the water? It's probably too small. Let me make it bigger. So I'm going to make this 100. See, now I have this giant water on the floor. It's reflective, which is really cool. And then I can make the scale bigger. Let's make it like 100. And now this is it's probably too big. Let me make it actually make this 50. Oops. 
Now you can see how this water, it's moving kind of slowly. I can make it move um, faster by changing the flow speed here. This is using like a water shader and it reflects everything, which is cool. Um, what else, what other kind of cool features? Another cool feature you can do is add a terrain map, which is a grayscale image. So if you want to add a landscape, so uh, I can add a terrain element here. It can be any grayscale element. So you can actually literally go in Photoshop and draw this. So I have like these three terrain files here. And you go into here, it's really big. I can make it, I can scale everything to be like, uh, let's make the width and height like much bigger. I have like a terrain in the distance. Make it taller. Let's move it down a little bit. Um, now I have this like terrain that I'm on with a lake in the middle. Um, and then I can add a texture to it by, let me just upload a texture file. And like on a sandy terrain, maybe the scale is too big, so I can uh, change that to like 50. Let's see, how does that look? So it is a little annoying that you have to go back and forth between like the two tabs. Eventually, we're going to unify it into one thing. But yeah, you see, now I have like a terrain here with a building sticking out of it. Um, <laughs> so um, let's see. I um, you can also do a really cool thing you can do is actually, uh, you can add a screen share so I can add, um, let's make it like 10, let's make it just really big so I can see it. I'll make it like 50. There's a couple of questions on the chat. Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll read them out. So hyper icon is asking, can one upload generative GS scripts and put them on a canvas like a video? So, uh, Jen, let me look at, let me read the question in the chat so I actually understand it. Or you can just ask it, actually. You want to ask it? And I can see, or let me see what the question is. They're on the, yeah, they're on the second cohort. There's some, a few mm -hmm. questions. Discord. Even yeah, Stefan okay. has a really good question. Actually, I'm really interested in it. Would it be super cool? Um, can you upload generative AI skips? Uh, not currently. Um, we're working on letting people do like shaders and custom interactions. Um, OK, so can one upload? Uh, we're, we're, you can actually do video maps onto, onto things. So we, we are doing, OK, so as far as integration with Wallet, the, um, we are adding a feature. I'm working on a feature now where you can load, you basically can input a token ID and address. and. Um, load it into, it'll automatically load the NFT. Actually, I'll show it to you here. Um, where is it? So these things are all loaded from um, like OpenSea and SuperRare. So I'll tell you why we don't currently not working on. Um, so, so here's like a new feature that's coming out soon where I can actually put in, um, Let's see, you see this is like an NFT, it's from OpenSea. I have the token address and token ID. I can go to OpenSea and um, the reason why we don't want to force you to log in with your wallet to access it is because a lot of the times, like if you're a curator and you're bringing work from a bunch of different people, you don't want to have to have them log in to like Arium to be able to show their NFTs. You want to give people the flexibility of just putting in whatever token they want to. But we do want to let people eventually log in with their Web3 wallet, whether it's Ethereum or, or on Tezos and load it automatically so it's much faster. But I'll just show you quickly how, let's say I have, uh, let's say I want to like add something from known origin. I can um, like just take this token. Uh, eventually we're going to make it so you can paste a URL, but I can like, um, where is it? Where did that thing go? No. So I can put in this new token address, and then I can put in this token ID.
and just loading it. Why did it reload? Sorry, it's because it's on my local server. Hold on. So this is just in development right now. Just reload it. But yeah, so you see now it loaded that. It even loads like the description in a placard. So if I go to, um, oops. Is it reloading? I think there's a bug where there's an image. It's crashing. That's why we haven't released this yet. We're like looking at this stuff. Let me just choose a different one, like a video here. Oh, event. actually, we're going to change it so you can paste the URL. I realize it's kind of cumbersome. So I just want to show you another actually really useful feature, which we're going to release soon once we just have a user interface, which is called theming. So Sorry, I'm not sure yes. if you answered some of the questions. Uh, Stefano said, uh, is there any way to create generative terrains or any scripting to influence the space? Um, we're not. So the thing that we want to add is the ability that you can have any parameter. Um, there's no current way to do scripting. Um, we want to support like an SDK. And actually, I think we want to open source. Eventually, we want to open source a lot of this and then let people do an SDK. We're just really early right now, so we haven't had the chance to build that. But definitely in the plans to let people do custom scripting. And I think the, the first step that we would do is like any of these parameters, you would be able to pull from a REST API. So basically, you could like open a, a, a HTTP endpoint and you could pull it and automatically like update anything in here. Um, the one concern we have is like we want to actually let people execute smart contracts inside of an ARM space. And there's like a little bit of security concern if people are able to like add dynamic scripts inside of an ARM space. So like, we just have to like really be careful with that. But I think it would be really cool if people could, because that would open a whole slew of new possibilities. So I'd love to be able to support that. So we just have to be really careful. Um, I don't know where that sound's coming from. Oh, it's the, this one. Sorry. So one other thing I just want to show, which we're releasing soon, which is going to be very, very valuable, it's just called theming. So, so see how these are all like white and black you, in, in, with, a, with like, um, you could with like a single interface, you could change everything to be, uh, backing color. I could change everything to be, for example, black. That's actually not working. Oh, that's because of that part. Yeah, so I, with like a single thing, I can change everything across the space to have um, like a common style. And this is like a huge pain for us before because we would have to go like through each one of these if we wanted to change anything and edit it. So soon there'll be like theming where you can um, change all these things at once. And then you can change, for example, like how wide the placards are. If you want to uh, show the description, not, you know, so you, you have the ability to like change that all for one place instead of having to edit it one by one. And then all the pieces will look the same and you'll be able to override it on a piece by piece basis. Okay, uh, let's see, more questions. Then yeah, the next I think the next thing we're working on is basically letting people purchase tokens directly in a space. Because I think that would like make everything really seamless and help people sell more artwork, which is ultimately like one of the main goals of everyone to support themselves. I'm gonna go back to the chat and, and try to answer some questions. Where is it? Yeah, 
Dan, I got cut off for a, a minute when my internet went down, but I just wanted to ask, have you shown the uh, 3D video geometries yet? Oh, no. So this is actually a really cool feature. So I can, so see this building here? I can actually do a live stream 3D projection onto it. So I've gone into Blender, and this isn't, I'm going to do actually a whole video on how to do it. So where's my Blender? So I actually separated out um, this part of the building as like one object. And uh, this is an advanced topic, but if I select this one, oops. I've UV mapped it into like a flat thing by a really cool feature. If you're curious, if you do UV project from view, if I want to do view um, viewpoint front, oops. And so this basically, if I do, so this will basically generate a UV map, which t tells the thing how to um, uh, place an image or video on the surface or any kind of texture. And then what I do is I can go into OBS. Actually, let me first show you the feature and I'll show you how it's actually made. So if I go to, uh, I have this, like I can add a video and actually, you could do, uh, it projects onto, let me actually choose a video, a previous video that worked. Let me show you how to build it. So I have here actually like a simulated live stream playing on a building. So you can actually take a video and you could have what it plays on. You could choose it. It could be any arbitrary geometry. And that video can come from a live stream. And that's actually, actually a really powerful concept. And the, the geometry, if it's a GLB file, it can be animated. So this is actually simulating a live stream. It's pulling from our service. And um, basically the way I mapped it was I, uh, for people that understand this stuff, and I'm gonna actually do a whole video on this. Sorry, I have so many tabs open. Let me mute this tab. So uh, I, in OBS, which I'm gonna show here, Right now, I'm playing a video, but uh, Dan, I, we're still seeing your Chrome window. I think you're just sharing the window. OK, let me share. Um, where is my um, Discord? Oops. Screens. OK. So uh, let's say I turn off this thing. I have the UV map that I just exported that image here. And then I can, I, I want to, uh, I can actually like, sorry, uh, I can move this. I guess this is the whole thing. I can like move this video um, basically to line up with that UV map that I exported. Again, this is complicated stuff. But basically, I start streaming, and it'll stream this whole video. But because the UV map thing tells the 3D model where to place the video, it works. And I'm actually going to do a video that explains this better. Um, but we use our own streaming service called Mux, which is really awesome. So if I start streaming here, let me actually turn off the UV map. It's like us. It's like our. It's like Twitch as a service. So. This is, you're gonna see the live stream come into here. It just takes a little bit of time to come in. And any of you could sign up for a Mux thing. So it's basically like live streaming from my thing and then I can use that playback ID and pull it into Arium um, by basically uh, any video object can be either like a stored video or a, or a live stream ID from Mux.
don't know why the element preview isn't working. Um, and I'm going to do actually a tutorial video on this because I think this is a really cool feature that could lead to some really interesting live performance possibilities. Like you could, um, yeah, you could have one stream with a bunch of different cameras like packed into it and unpack them onto different servers. You could have visuals like you could basically wrap this whole building with a projection, like Refik Agendal style, which I think would be really cool. Um, another thing, if anyone's wondering, can you update the skybox? Yes. So, uh, so you can basically just upload what another HDRI here, which is really cool. Um, let me just cho choose another one. Um, HDRIs. Adobe Stock. It's fine. This one here. I'm gonna upload a different one. How big is that? That's too big of a file, but anyways, now you see I have a new skybox. It's all live, like you can change this all during an event. And like your whole space can change, which is really cool. Um, okay, I think that's it for uh, my demo. I think I went through like a lot really, really fast. But I'm gonna make a whole video on how to do this live streaming. Okay. Any other questions? So yeah, imagine like you can have an event where you have different rooms that open up at different times or because everything's like live, uh, it really, you could do a lot of cool stuff. I'm just gonna mention, I'm gonna post um, our emails. Um, I mean, of course you can DM us here, um, but I'm gonna post our emails in the, um, in the residency second cohort chat um, in case you wanna email us there. Um, and follow us, and if you want to join our Discord, which would be cool because we'd appreciate it, I'll paste, I'll paste our Discord in here. And we can... Uh... Yeah. Um... Yeah, I realize it's too much. Uh, the portals, the portals are very simple. I can just actually show it to you quickly. So I can. Um, I'm in Desert Warehouse. I can just literally add a portal. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. One second. So uh, I can. So I go to the elements. I add a portal. Again, it's annoying that you have to do this in two separate tabs. We really want to combine everything into like one experience. We just don't have time right now. So basically, uh, you can, let me turn off the building for a second so you'll see it. Let me make it really big, show helper. Where is it? Big. There it is. So there's a big, big ass, big portal. Uh, and you could choose uh, which space you want it to go to. Um, I can have it go to the whale community. You can choose where you want it to go to in the other space and where you want it to look at. You can even have it go into the current space into another position. So you could have someone like jump into a different space. So if I go here, I just go into this portal and it can either be visible or hidden, so you can like have you could upload your own three D model if you wanted to become a, like a, the portal visual element. But if I go into here, then I just go into the whale community space. Yeah, that's it. It's just basically there. You choose a space to transport to, or you could have it go like to the same space to a different place. Okay. File size limit. Um, 
so that's a good question. I mean, videos can be large. I mean, I think we try to keep them. I think we ideally, like, you don't want anything more than a bytes. Ideally, every is around 20. You can, the nice thing about video is even if you upload a, lar a large video, it shows the thumbnail, a very smaller size thumbnail when the video is not playing. So it still loads fast for everyone. And then once they go up close and look at the video, it'll swap it to the video file. So that makes everything go faster. Um, as far as 3D models, I mean, generally, like, so, for example, for a hack of a bear for this space, uh, we got, like, a, we got a really uh, large bear head file from the artist. That was, like, 60 megabytes. And we took it in Blender and reduced it down to, like, I think, 10 megabytes. Uh, because, I mean, the more that's... The images are fine, um, so... Usually what we'll do is you don't want someone loading a 50 megabyte file in the space. What, what, what it generally is, is that in the space, the, it'll be resized to like uh, 1280p and you can control the size actually. So let's say I go to, um, uh, and then when you click on it, it'll show the full resolution. Um, it'll show the full resolution video. It just because you don't want to render a 50 megabyte file in a 3D space, it's just going to destroy everyone's computer. So your image, we will automatically resize it for you, which some people might not like, but we can let people control like the size dynamically. I think right now the max size is 1280p, but we can make, we can add it like higher if people want it, want it. And what's nice is even if it's an IPFS URL, the, the, the resized image will not be IPFS, but when they click on it to view the full resolution thing. So for example, like uh, in whale community, these are all images that we are dynamically generating thumbnails for. And even actually these are originally GIFs, but we convert them to videos because you can't play GIFs in 3D space. It's like a limitation. But then when you click on it, this is actually the original GIF from IPFS. And the same thing would happen if it was the image. Like, it'll load the original image from IPFS. Uh, for 3D models, so one of the nice things that actually makes things run faster is we allow you to, for collisions, you can actually add a hidden mesh that's a collision mesh that's not visible. And there's instructions on how to do that. And like, you can, so this is actually a pretty high polygon, polygon count model, and it runs OK. It's very curvy, like, but, um, Invisible to the user, there's a low, very low poly collision mesh, which makes everything. So if it's a high poly mesh for collisions, it's going to be really slow. So the low poly collision mesh, which basically determines the collision mesh determines like if you can walk through a wall or not. Um, that will be uh, if that's what people are using for collisions, it's much faster. And there's a there's a documentation on how to do that. It just you you tag meshes in Blender with like certain attributes, and then Arm automatically knows to like mark them as invisible. Any other questions? I yes, there is an invisible battery. I have a quick question for for you all, and I guess for Mikol, which is, what are you all thinking as far as um, the, maybe I'm asking too soon into the residency, but thinking as far as the end of the residency, um, uh, Mikol? Um, I think it's a bit too soon, but I mean, all options are, are open pretty much as we did uh, the last time. It was kind of like a collaborative, creative effort between like anybody who wanted to get involved, uh, which I think turned out to be pretty amazing. So as always, I'm keeping everything very open to anything. I think I, I'm feeling a sense that it will be very different than, than the last time, which is interesting. Um, because there's like the group is very different as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Very cool. Thank you. 
I don't know if anybody has like any, I mean, I open to everybody, like if you already are thinking of something, like I'd love to hear uh, if anybody has any like ideas. I would love to see performance. Nobody's, very few people are doing performance right now. It'd be really great if people do more performance stuff. For sure. I think that would be amazing, yes. I'm, I'm creating an exhibition here in Brazil with some queer and LGBTQ people. And we, we are really connected with performance, fashion, and digital things. And I, I, I really have a friend that will be really super excited to, to get into Arium. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to now build something inside this. And I would love to, to I don't know, like bring more people together, you know? And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for the classes and for the invitation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll just say um, quickly, like DM us or, or email us. We'd love to talk further about um, other shows as well. That sounds fantastic. All right. Th thank you all for, for having us. Thank you so much. I don't know if there's any last uh, questions, but I think we definitely had, <laughs> we answered a lot. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Dan and Aiden. And if you haven't had a chance to put your name on the, on the sheet, uh, there's a few spots uh, left. So yeah, feel free to add your name and start playing around with Arium. And and if you have any friends that want it, like just let us know. The only reason we're not just like anyone can sign up right now is because it's a bit it's the UX isn't quite there to like just let anyone use it. Um, and also, we just want to be mindful of the community using it. But just like if you know anyone else that would find this interesting, please pass it along. Like, and we'll give them an invite. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for having us. It was so nice to connect with you all and uh, talk to you soon.